Bay Bass reintroduction and our future freshwater mussel reintroductions as well. And we're very lucky to work with uh, various state and federal agency partners and uh, really working closely with different departments here at SARA. And I'd say my favorite part of the job is working with uh, citizen groups and working on uh, outreach and education events like this. We've done some really cool and impactful events since I've started at the River Authority, and it really adds this uh, another more personal layer to the job. So uh, most pertinent to this talk are the invasive species removal programs we have here. And so first we'll break down the different commonly applied terms when we're discussing invasive species and we'll be going over a few case studies from the San Antonio River Basin with a focus on apple snails. Uh, it's quite a bit of information. Uh, so uh, I'll break it down by species. We'll be talking about apple snails, zebra mussels, uh, plecostomus, which is a, a fish, armored catfish, and then uh, elephant ear, which is a, uh, a plant. So if you wanna take notes or just type your questions in as, as we're going, that's great. So really what is an invasive species? There's some conflicting definitions and sometimes very scattered terminology and understanding what, uh, of what an invasive species is. So first we'll go over uh, a little bit of terminology here. Again, a lot of words. This is actually taken, uh, taken from a paper, uh, a scientific publication by Vingeli, uh, Vingeli, I? <laughs> and so first, uh, a native indigenous species. I prefer the term native. That is what's most commonly used in the, in the literature right now. And so that's a species that naturally occurs or originates from a specific geographical region since prehistoric time and introduced alien uh, or exotic species will, uh, I'd say non-native is my preferred term here. And those are uh, species that are uh, deliberate or accidental releases uh, into an area of where they haven't been, uh, haven't occurred in historical times. Invasive, the big one, uh, it's the establishment of a self-regenerating and spreading uh, populations of species living in this free state in the wild, uh, which takes possession of a habitat almost and may uh, impact the area or other species uh, injuriously. And a nuisance or noxious species. These aren't commonly used, but I think they're really important. Uh, they're typically invasive, but defined as uh, species that are injurious to public health, agriculture, recreation, uh, wildlife, property, or, um, yeah. And so a noxious weed is kind of how I think about this, which is uh, commonly defined as a plant that grows out of place and is competitive, persistent, and pernicious, which is uh, just negatively impacts something. And so another, uh, a couple not so used terms, uh, feral species is really interesting to me because we always use that term. Uh, those are really an animal living in the wild, but who are descended from domesticated individuals like uh, released pets, livestock, and other game animals. And wild horses and cats are actually examples of some of these because they fight sur uh, for survival without human intervention. Cats are really amazing at that. They get all the birds. And so these are a bunch of species that invasive species, non-native that we have in our basin or very close by. So we have apple snails, zebra mussels, quilted melania, uh, which are um, a spiral kind of uh, snail, which aren't really talked about a lot, but they are very, um, prevalent in streams here. Uh, we have different fish, quite a lot of invasive non-native fish. We have uh, uh, sucker, sucker mouth catfish, which are armored and sailfish, sailfin catfish. We have Rio Grande cichlids, three different kinds of tilapia. 
we really only see the blue tilapia in, in our uh, basin here. We have common carp, a couple of other carps, which their names escape me, but we really mostly see common carp here. We have Mexican tetra, uh, two mollies, uh, green swordtail, red breast sunfish. We have mammals like nutria and wild hogs, which we definitely all know about wild hogs. And we have a bunch of invasive plants here, aquatic plants like elephant ear and uh, hyacinth, in addition to uh, the salvinia, giant, giant or great, one of those. But there's a, a bunch more invasive aquatic plants that I'm not too familiar with those. And so here's some lovely photos of a bunch of these. On the top left, we have corbicula, which is a, a freshwater clam that is very prolific. It almost, it can actually constitute about 90% or more of the biomass in a single stream. It's incredible. I've actually seen the substrate or uh, bottom of a stream completely corbicula. And that's specifically, that was in the San Juan remnant channel next to that mission. We have apple snails, different kinds of uh, zebra mussels, uh, all the different fish. We have a Rio Grande cichlid, a blue tilapia, red breast sunfish, uh, and that carp right in the bottom right hand corner, which are, they get so big. And so invasive species are really this worldwide problem. They're frequently in the news and they've caused obvious harm to landscapes and infrastructure. This really, uh, this increase in travel and open trade routes has provided the means for increased exchanges of organisms. And these organisms can be uh, microscopic algae cells or uh, larger kinds of castaways like uh, fish eggs or crustaceans. And they actually often float about in the thousands of tons of water that boats use as ballast. And so uh, ballast water is water that a large ship usually will uh, keep in the ship to uh, create buoyancy in the event that they don't have enough cargo on it or if the seas are really rough. It's pretty interesting. And so when these ships dump their ballast at a port, they, uh, the species can really establish this foothold in foreign lands, uh, obviously with often detrimental consequences to native wildlife. And the costs, I put 137 billion here, but that's a gross underestimation. So I'll try to find an actual cost there. I think that was a cost from many years ago. So it's definitely in the hundreds of billions. And approximately 42% of threatened or endangered species are at risk due to these non-native and invasive species. Luckily, in a sense, we don't have any threatened or endangered species here. So uh, that gives us the opportunity to use more uh, aggressive methods to control some of these invasive and non-native species. And invasive species compete with native species for food and habitat. They degrade native habitats through uh, physical modification of resources and they're very efficient uh, vectors for many diseases. And so a lot of diseases can be spread easily to other organisms in, uh, in aquatic or terrestrial habitats and also to us. And a lot of most non-native and uh, highly invasive species definitely disrupt all of our social and economic activities that uh, where we depend on water resources. And everyone can see this if they're uh, at the river walk or the, the river loop downtown. Everyone will take a glance and look at those large pink egg cases or the snails. And that's definitely become like an attraction for some uh, tourists. They always will learn about it, which is good that they learned about invasives. And so here's some modes of invasion or vectors. So we have different transportation uh, methods here, generally on boat hulls or trailers, uh, recreationally usually ship ballast water for large cargo ships that are going across the ocean via trade routes. 
same with different cargo transportations. We have living industries, so that's aquaculture, uh, the aquarium and pet trade, or uh, live seafood trade, I think of lobsters or something like that. And we have other miscellaneous uh, modes of invasion, like uh, just a natural spread, a disturbance of an ecosystem will allow for uh, easier invasion from uh, non-native species because they don't necessarily react the same way to a common disturbance, say a flood or yeah, I think a flood's a pretty good, uh, a good one there. Definitely fire as well. Intentional releases from aquariums at home and biological control. Think of a carp that was used to manage algae somewhere and that just getting out of control. So how can we minimize the unintentional introduction of invasive species? A lot of this falls into the hands of the maritime industry uh, with the ballast water, transport on hulls of ships, uh, escape from, from fish farms is really uh, a big one there. Uh, canals and waterways that'll connect to uh, two different bodies of water, live bait releases, uh, aquarium releases, recreational boating, transport of agricultural products and the exotic uh, pet trade industry. The, the transport of agricultural products, I always think of those little bugs that you might find on a head of lettuce <laughs> after you get it from the store. I don't know if it's just me that finds that, but that's something that I think about. And so this case study number one is really about the apple snails, right? So these are a really high profile hot topic in San Antonio currently because of their increasingly obvious presence throughout the river walk specifically. So the River Authority first received reports of apple snail presence in San Antonio in October 2019 downtown near the marina. And we knew that they were occurring or, or present in neighboring watersheds, but they just had yet to be documented in ours. So the River Authority received a permit for apple snail removals two months later in December 2019 uh, from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And uh, we have been managing and removing them ever since and kind of expanding our program. So these apple snails are often the local news and their presence is widely known among residents of the city and the watershed at large. You've probably seen a bunch of articles on them. If you haven't, you see a whole bunch of screen grabs right now. You might have heard about them on the radio or local news stations. And if you've been downtown at the Riverwalk during the summer or spring, you've definitely seen the adults or at least their pink egg casings. And you can still actually see the egg casings where we've scraped them from uh, pillars or the sides of the of the channel, they get kind of crusty and they're still there, but we kind of do our best to, to get them uh, as clear as possible. And so something that's often cited is that they do harbor a parasite uh, known as rat lungworm, but a lot of folks don't realize that there's actually three other pathogens that these can harbor, which I won't get into, but definitely look them up if you'd like to. So a bit of information on their biology. So they're native to South America, but have way, uh, made their way across the world, really. They're typically found on the margins of shallow and slow moving waters, just like the, uh, the river walk is channelized, very slow moving. And they were first found in 1989 in the US and in Texas in 2000. They're definitely most active around dusk and dawn. So if you go to the river walk around 6 a.m. or 6 p.m., you have a, a greater chance of seeing the adults. Uh, they're most active in the summer and in warmer water. And we actually see them up until December because our water stays relatively warm. And I'm sure we all know that uh, they pose some ecological impact, serious ones to native vegetation, which was. Uh, which will result in landscape degradation. And I think personally that we're starting to see this a bit at King William. Uh, 
but we definitely have been seeing this in the museum reach and we might might be doing a small little study to kind of quantify the amount of vegetation that they might eat in a certain day or week month i think that would be really useful and they have a really impressive temperature tolerance which ranges from uh, 50 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Very impressive. So vegetation plays a really important role in aquatic ecosystems, right? Uh, it serves as a food, a food source for lower trophic levels, acts as a nursery habitat for fish, and also serves as habitat for bugs and other critters like snakes and young dragonfly and damselfly nymphs, which are almost fully aquatic in their young stage before they molt into adults. During spring and summer, you might find apple snails exactly as you see here. They are mating. The female is the much larger one and the male is the smaller one. And so each female can lay clutches every seven to 10 days, uh, a clutch of eggs and upwards of 20 clutches per year and they have up to 2,000 eggs. Uh, I've heard reports of 800 on average, but also some uh, about 2,000 on average and going up to 3,000 in a single clutch. And these have a 10 to 14 day maturation period. So they're pretty quick to hatch. And so we do quite a few removals here uh, mostly for apple snails and trying to mitigate them by reducing their populations. So the river warriors, uh, SWCA is a, an outside environmental firm that we hire to help us with this. And the river authority, we all work together. Uh, it's a really great partnership and it's so cohesive. The river warriors are certified through uh, river authority training, uh, which will allow them to remove apple snails in their egg casings. Uh, and then they'll use an online self-reporting tool, which I'll show you. And this is that training for you. So what can you do? Uh, after this training, you sign a waiver and you'll receive an active partner status. Uh, and you'll be considered one of the agents of the River Authority. And so, like I said, trained river warriors will be able to capture and dispose of these adults and the egg casings as well. And don't pour salt on them. I don't know why I have that there. <laughs> so the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department actually requests that we place the adults in uh, black, black garbage bags or black, uh, strong black plastic bags, I suppose. And we want you to dispose of them in a garbage can, not a recycling bin. Please don't compost these. I've had someone ask that. Uh, a couple people ask that. Personally, I wouldn't want one of these in my compost. They're not very sightly. And so if you're out there, you'll definitely be approached. Uh, whenever I'm out doing removals, I probably field at least 10 to 20 questions or comments. And this is actually probably one of the uh, my favorite parts of the process, which is getting to share uh, information with others and encourage them to really get involved. And so it makes me really happy that everyone's here today as well. So if you're approached, really use this as a teaching moment. Tell them what apple snails are, why we don't want them, why we're removing them, and please tell them that you can't eat them because they will ask. So the number one rule here is safety first and foremost. You want to avoid crowded areas like downtown as much as you can. Uh, we don't want anyone to get hurt. So if you're practicing these proper safety procedures, then others will too. So we're all setting a really good example here. A big one is make sure you really wear safety gloves when handling eggs or adults and wash your hands after handling them. Please don't lean over high walls seen people do this, uh, had to discourage. Pretty obvious reason, you don't want to fall in and I don't want to fish you out of the channel. So really just use common sense. And I'm sure everyone here is really smart. So you'll make really well-informed decisions. And the different reaches here are the museum reach, 
And so this is the extent of it from Josephine Street down to Brooklyn Avenue. Uh, the downtown reach, which is from Brooklyn to Nueva Street, East Nueva Street. King William, which is uh, from East Nueva Street to Parita Street, I believe, uh, right up to Blue Star. And then Eagle Land, which is from uh, right on Haken South to Roosevelt Park, right on Lone Star Boulevard. So these are the four different areas that you can go to. Downtown is definitely a tricky one. So I'd focus on museum and King William. Definitely King William is probably the, the most friendly to uh, explore. And it's also probably the prettiest. So I always uh, prefer that one. And so this is a couple screen grabs of the form, the self-reporting form that's online. You'll be reporting uh, your removal numbers yourself. And so you might have seen this before, not sure, but I'll actually be slightly modifying the form to make it a little bit more intuitive. Uh, but it's a really great tool for helping to supply us with these numbers. And again, a great example of the partnerships with you and with folks in our department as well. So if you're ever in an area not in these uh, in the four designated areas and you see apple snail adults or egg casings, please let us know either in the comments of the self-reporting tool or with an email to me or Minna, and I'm sure those will be supplied uh, after this. And just to show you how these efforts and partnerships have paid off. Uh, so here's a graph I made which shows the number of snails and eggs removed per uh, removal event throughout 2021 alone, which means each time we go out to remove snails and eggs, which is about every 10 to 14 days, we incorporate all the removal numbers from uh, River Warriors, the outside company, and ourselves. And these are really these incredible results of those removals. The blue line on top are the egg casing numbers uh, and the number of snails, the adults removed, are the bottom red line. So you can see that at one point in early September, we removed almost uh, probably about 1,900 egg casings in one day, probably in the span of five hours, and almost uh, probably about 500 adults, which is really incredible. And so you don't always think about how many adults or egg casings are there. I did not until I started doing the removals. And this graph also shows the cumulative numbers of egg casings and snails that we've removed. Uh, and this is just 2021 alone. So in 2021, we've removed just under 18,000 egg casings and 3,600 adult apple snails. So it's really incredible. And that uh, highlights the efforts that uh, our partners are achieving. So that's you, that's us, that's as many people as we can get involved. And so one more thing that I really wanna highlight here is that the presence of apple snails has given us the opportunity to develop a partnership with a researcher named Dr. Romy Burks from Southwestern University. She's studying apple snail eDNA, which is uh, short for environmental DNA. And this is used to detect apple snail DNA in the water by analyzing water samples. And this is illustrated by the graphic on the right. And so basically, this is a fish, but basically their DNA is shed in the water. There's different uh, factors that will impact how much DNA and uh, the quality of it uh, is released. But we really aren't worrying about that. We're just worrying, trying to find out if we can uh, use the river walk within the city as kind of as an experiment and to develop a process to detect the presence of apple snails and to also quantify their abundance in any water, bo uh, water body. We also, I'll talk about the river draining later, I believe. Uh, we actually removed about 700 apple snails, adults, during this year's river draining. And all of those were sent to Dr. Burks for her research uh, with proper permitting for donations of these specimens, of course. And just a quick reiteration and maybe a different way to frame this. 
the snails are, are they are edible, but it's strongly uh, not recommended. So although they're edible, we really want to avoid encouraging people to uh, eat them. One reason, uh, a pretty obvious one, is the risk of these deadly parasites. I don't want to chance myself with that. And so many people are pretty aware of that. It's the obvious one. Everyone talks about it. But more importantly, at least in my opinion, creating a market for the apple snails will increase the risk of spreading them to new areas. Uh, encouraging a market for any invasive species is uh, probably never a good idea. And we have seen this over time in a few areas. The apple snails actually took hold in most of Eastern Asia after first being brought into Taiwan uh, as uh, for aquaculture farming in 1979. And after a few years, they expanded to islands, uh, to China, and then to uh, Japan and the Philippines uh, really fast. And so while eating the problem away sounds like a great way to help, uh, this can result in the species getting transported to new areas. So once a market is created here, we have absolutely no control. Uh, for example, with issues like byproduct escaping when in transport. So to reiterate, safety rules. Definitely uh, use your common sense, best professional judgment, uh, ask questions. We're always here for you to uh, lean on. Our partnership is really important to us. So helping you will help us. It'll help everyone in the watershed and to provide the, the best stewardship and guidance that we can. So I think you know everything about the apple snails now. You'll dispose of them in garbage cans, right? You won't touch them except with gloves on. And those are really the main points that I have to uh, emphasize. And so with that, I believe we're all set with your apple snail training. Uh, Minna, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yes, um, if everyone can uh, please email me with interest so that way I have a um, list of all the master naturalists interested in going out and removing these snails. Um, that would be fantastic. And I will be emailing you the waiver that uh, everyone needs to sign. It's an electronic waiver. So if uh, if you can get the waiver signed, um, then you're all, all set to go, uh, go out and dispatch these snails. Um, Stephen, I'm sorry, did you already sp uh, talk about dispatching the egg cases as well? Yeah, oh, Okay. I did not, you're okay. right. So you'll scrape the egg cases off uh, into a bucket. Uh, very important to not touch those egg cases. So if you scrape them into a bucket, you want to uh, crush them completely. Uh, some people have said just to scoop them into the water to drown them, but that's not the best plan because they could just wash up onto the, the bank and into vegetation. So scoop them into a bucket, crush them really well, and throw them in that bag as well. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess that's it. Uh, you're trained and, um, you know, I would invite everybody to to um, to come out and and help us um, really get these invasive species out of our river. The hope is that you know um, with all of us uh, you know contributing, I think uh, we'll we'll win this fight, right, Stephen? I agree. I agree. <laughs> it's definitely important for us to do our best to mitigate. That's probably the most important management strategy we have, and not just with my team, but with. Uh, our team as a whole, river warriors, river biologists over here, uh, everyone at Sarah, like Minna, really coordinating everything. It's really amazing. So I definitely want to see everyone out there. <laughs> yeah. And if you can get a group together, I would invite you to, um, you know, uh, get a team. 
Uh, and always when we are doing this, we uh, do recommend going out in pairs, like having a buddy system, because sometimes you don't, when you're going along the river, um, you're on one side and, you know, you can see the other side, the wall on the other side. So it's, it helps when you have one more person and then, and for safety reasons as well, definitely recommend a buddy system or a group. So that way, you know, just in case of accidents or anything like that, you have some, you know, someone else to help as well. So... Um, that being said, yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, invite everybody, see you all on the river, and we'll get this, this, this species out together. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be, I have a couple more invasive species to talk about that are uh, pretty prevalent in our basin and some that are newly emerging and they're good to, to hear about as well. So I'm positive that a lot of you have heard about zebra mussels. Um, I'm from the Northeast of the, the US, New York, so closer to the Great Lakes. And that is really where the zebra mussel problem started. So it's really another emerging invader, but it's also really been here in the US for a long time. It's, it was first detected in 1988 in Lake St. Clair in Michigan. Um, by 1990, it was found in all five Great Lakes at in really high abundances. It's really a, pro a prolific spreader. 2009, it made its way all the way to Lake Texoma, which uh, is on the border of Oklahoma and Texas. So really far. And by 2011, zebra mussels have been reported in over half of the states here. And so ballast water, uh, which is the fresh water or salt water that's held in those, those tanks in the cargo ships are thought to be the first uh, incidents for the uh, introduction of those zebra mussels to one of those lakes. And so here you can see the distribution map, just worry about those red dots. Those are the zebra mussels. They're everywhere. They really have made their way all across the US, but they haven't made it to West yet, just to us. And we're really the, the, the westernmost portion over here in the San Antonio Basin, which is really interesting. And so some of this, these are the shows that they're present in Texas. They're spreading westward. You can see that there's uh, one one occurrence in our watershed here. I don't know if I can actually point, but it's there, I promise. It's just the one in the upper part of the watershed. And so these mussels were discovered in Texas around 2009 and have since recently spread to Lake Medina and made their way to a few other lakes outside of our basin as well. And so they've also been in the news quite a bit, especially uh, lately, they've uh, everyone's taken an interest to them as well because we've heard a little bit more about them, and uh, agencies here have done a little bit more, uh, been more proactive about monitoring for them uh, since they made their way into our basin already. So let's talk a little bit about their biology to explain why they're such a strong invader. So they're originally from Eastern Europe, but have made their way. Uh, to the U.S. Uh, by means of the ballast water, right? So they're making their way here primarily from recreational boating. That's probably the number one. They plaster their, themselves to anything and everything from bottom substrate where you would expect a mussel to be to wooden docks or even plastic bottles floating on the water. That's really something to see. And you can see what they look like. Uh, the top right image is those, the little threads coming out are uh, called bissel threads, which I'll mention in just a little bit. And they are incredibly strong. They're little, little strands with a little dab of a, a fluid that's just like cement and they can stick themselves to anything forever. So on average, zebra mussels live about uh, two to five years and can 
reproduce by their second year. So each year, a mature female zebra mussel will uh, release up to 1 million eggs, while the male may reduce, uh, produce and release more than 200 million sperm. So it's like a two to one ratio there. So very effective. Uh, and that's spread into the water where the fertilization takes place. And so after fertilization, uh, about two days after the eggs develop into these free swimming larvae, which are called villagers, uh, which can be transported over really long distances by water currents, very, very, very far. And within about two to three weeks, the villagers begin to uh, settle out in the water under the weight of their uh, newly forming shells and they attach to firm underwater surfaces. They, the zebra mussels cling to surfaces by using these uh, thread-like surfaces, uh, strands called bissel fibers, which are just tipped with this strong, sticky substance. And it's been found that as many as 700,000 of these mussels can occupy a single square meter. Insane. So once they're attached, they generally stay in this one place, but they can actually detach and crawl to a new location if environmental conditions change and they want to get to more uh, preferred conditions. They're really a very incredible organism and they're very self-sufficient. And they selectively feed on green algae and then they leave uh, blue algae only, which is often correlated with causing water to have a really bad taste and odor, uh, while also resulting in the increasing costs for water treatment. So their environmental impacts are really big, especially with that uh, water clarity. So they're filter feeders, which means they feed by filtering nutrients from the water, uh, which passes through them. And the rate of their reproduction and spread of them make make them really efficient filters of Great Lakes water. But whether that's a positive or negative thing really depends on who you're asking. So some people think the water clarity is a benefit, but personally, I think it really depends. They are likely accumulating contaminants and bacteria that could be human pathogens. So it could be beneficial that they're removing some of those, but then they also become a sink uh, for that if they could, since they'll probably be later released. And it's good to remember that filter and clean are not synonymous. You're filtering, but is the water really clean? No. They, probably the most obvious to me and the most pertinent that I really care about is that they compete with native mussels for food and habitat. They easily overtake a native mussel bed and quite literally smother all the other organisms, which uh, in turn reduces biodiversity or the number of species that are present. Uh, and you can see in some of the pictures here, they're starting to cover these uh, freshwater mussels and the mussels can likely no longer open. And on the left there, they actually have covered uh, this large crustacean and I'm not sure if that's alive. So there's also some recreational impacts. Uh, there are really great examples of uh, the impacts of zebra mussels here from, these are outside of Texas, um, mostly from the Great Lakes area, I believe. Uh, they affect boats, trailers, impact fishing, marinas, swimming. They can biofoul boat hulls and cause surface damage, which is detrimental to the boat, the boater, and will result in increased uh, monetary expenditure for maintaining the boat, uh, keeping it clean. They also can litter beaches, which really decreases property values and lowers the amount uh, that the beach is used. So there are some pretty obvious impacts that are really demonstrated by the Great Lakes, but um, they're, they're making the way down here. And as they get more 
uh, widespread and their populations uh, boom, we'll, we'll start to see some of that as well. So when they build up on boats, they increase the drag and inc increase fuel costs from that. And they over can overheat um, boat motors by clogging the water inlets. And there is something, actually someone told me today that there's anti-fouling paints, which can um, kind of detract from, clear the, the zebra mussels from uh, building up on the hulls, but their use has now really been banned or restricted in most states because of the known adverse effects on other aquatic organisms. So it's kind of difficult to target this one organism. And so this a one to two mil, millimeter layer of zebra mussels throughout a pipeline can actually reduce the efficiency of it on an average to five, uh, five to 10% due to this increased friction. The tubing can become clogged and overheat. Um, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service actually estimated that the zebra mussels will have an economic impact of upwards of $5 billion uh, in the US and Canada within the Great Lakes region, specifically over the next decade. And I'm curious to see if there's any numbers on that for Texas or other states that they've been in. And so here's some other photos of how they can clog pipes and other structures. It's incredible. Their densities are uh, just insane. Wow. And so monitoring here. So something we do, like I said, is monitoring and uh, management for native and non-native non species. So they're a novel invader in parts of Texas. In 2019, uh, the River Authority and other partners uh, developed this proactive routine monitoring program uh, to address the invader as it began its spread towards us. We installed these settlement samplers, as you see in that photo. It's settlement, not sediment. I had to learn that. Uh, we put them at Browning and Calaveras Lakes and Medina Lake. Uh, they're also this passive way to determine if zebra mussels are present, and if so, at what densities. So we also began, began these water collections at these lakes, which were sent to the wildlife department. Uh, in efforts to detect these mussel villagers, the larval form. And we actually had to adapt this program uh, following the detection of the zebra mussels at Medina Lake in March of 2021. So we're doing water sampling still at those lakes. We're starting at Bernie City Lake. Uh, Bernie City Lake um, and these settlement samplers are going to be installed downstream of these lake discharges to see if uh, mussels are detected there as well. And we're also actually going to install uh, a few more settlement samplers throughout the river walk. So you might see those. And they actually have informational tags on them that say they're there to detect invasive zebra mussels and to put them back in the water if they're taken out by someone, which someone always does. So if you find one, please put it back in the water. It's a really important process that benefits everyone in the watershed. So some agencies, uh, this is from Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, they've begun using detection dogs uh, to look at boats upon them exiting the water to, if, if you leave, they'll give you a ticket, but they wanna help you the best that they can uh, and it's a really good program. So what we do um, is take the, the net that you see on the right, we, it has a weight on the bottom, a little container, and you dunk it all the way down into the river column, and then you pull the net back up and it filters everything through. It's a really, really fine mesh. So we can catch all the microscopic organisms almost. And then you'll see on the, the left hand there, you pull it out, we're going to uncap that uh, the little bottle that captures everything. We'll uh, dump all of that into a bottle of alcohol to preserve it, and we send that to the Parks and Wildlife Department for them to identify those. 
And so another invader, uh, we just actually received reports a couple weeks ago about, or maybe even a week ago, about someone finding a single quagga mussel, which is closely related to the zebra mussel and also very present in the Great Lakes. So it's kind of as something we're really focusing on. So they're very similar. The quagga is usually a little bit larger. Um, the zebra mussel definitely has more obvious markings on it. But in the photo on the right, there's actually quagga and zebra mussels there. They coexist pretty peacefully. And so what can you do? Clean, drain, dry, wherever you are. Uh, this is definitely going to become something we emphasize more since we're really discovering and trying to be more proactive about um, all the species we have, all the invasives that we're finding here. So for our third little case study here, armored and sailfin catfish. So these are known broadly as sucker mouth catfish or armored catfish, but I, I'll refer to them as placos since they're all in the Loricariid family and largely similar. So they've been introduced across the country. They were actually introduced to the San Antonio River um, in 1962 after individuals uh, escaped the, the zoo. Very interesting way there. And so we see really large populations and an obvious presence. Uh, someone was actually at the Pearl taking a walk along the river walk yesterday and saw about 20 dead floating plecos and a few dead tilapia. We investigated it today and we determined that it was an effect of the cold snap that we had. Since they're tropical fish, they have less, uh, a lower tolerance to the cold. And they're often in the news. We try to highlight this uh, so folks understand what intentional aquarium releases can result in. And a great example is this article from one or two weeks ago where hundreds of plecos were removed from the San Marcos River, which is staggering. It makes me think, how many remain? How many do we not capture? Um, but I just learned today that they're actually using these for research. They kept them alive, and they're using them for research to try to create a sterile male, uh, which has been done for other kinds of fish, uh, to try to curb the population. So really interesting. And I I'm, I'm going to keep my ear up for that one, and hopefully we can send something to you if we learn anything else. So a lot of attention in our area because of this species, these species. There's multiple species within genus, and the taxonomy is really uncertain. So there's this push to clarify the distinction of the species, which might be helpful with removal and other management actions, trying to uh, see, determine if there's any different life history characteristics, habitat, food preferences uh, to different species. So as much information or life history information that we can get is uh, the best. It helps us. The more information, the better. They're all cavity builders and can lay more than 300 eggs in their nests. The males guard the nest and the eggs hatch within four to 20 days, depending on the species. They're very hardy fish, which can withstand a wide range of ecological conditions, but not the cold, apparently. They can actually gulp air and survive out of water for about uh, sometimes more than 20 hours. Uh, they also can survive in really uh, saline or salty habitats, so they can invade brackish water as well. And they're very long lived, about 15 to 20 years or potentially more. Uh, they're very abundant, and if their abundance is way too high, uh, native species can be outcompeted and reduced, which can really lead to this collapse of freshwater fisheries uh, and other ecological dangers, right? In a lot of places, they were introduced to control algae populations, but uh, it's unknown how effective these actually are at controlling algae. I'm going to assume that they're not very good at it because we don't have evidence of them being good at it. So this is another example of biological control gone wrong.
There's also reports of these fish inadvertently consuming fish eggs and macroinvertebrates while they're uh, trying to just suck up all the algae. They also uproot native vegetation and increase turbidity, cloudiness in the water. And they create these uh, big burrows in the, the sides of the bank. You can see that in that dry river. They go really far in and that's where their nests are. Sometimes they can avoid the cold in there, uh, cold and extreme heat. So the really spiny fins of these fish uh, can hurt or negatively impact uh, fishing gear. So they're really sharp, they're really rough. Whenever I handle them, sometimes they cut my hands just by touching them. Uh, hence the name armored catfish. And they have really sharp barbels as well. And they can, uh, if one gets stuck in a net, a gill net, they'll tear it up and probably get out of it. And they're pretty good at outcompeting native species and sport fish. So this damaged fishing gear, the destabilized banks, which results in some serious erosion, uh, also poses a big economic threat in the areas where uh, active fisheries are present, even for recreational fisheries. And so kind of lastly here, the management of plecos. The Texas state law actually requires that anglers, uh, recreational anglers, have to kill and dispose of these fish when they're caught. Not sure if anyone knows that, uh, but uh, hopefully we can uh, teach people that because I have a lot of folks that uh, report them, report finding them and not knowing what to do with them. And so personally, we at Sarah don't have any aggressive efforts ourselves. If we find one, we humanely dispatch these fish ourselves. Uh, but obviously, as you saw in San Marcos, they aggressively removed a lot of these fish. And so they definitely curbed a lot of the population uh, for a while. And so a really quick overview of tilapia. Um, didn't really want to talk about them too much, but blue tilapia are, are the ones that we, we really see in our basin and in the San Antonio River. Um, but there's two others. And the blues have been found to negatively impact fish, plants, uh, shrimp, mussel populations, and they really degrade habitat through this really uh, voracious herbivory, uh, eating of all the vegetation and their um, very destructive nesting activity. And so in some streams where they're really plentiful, they're those streams have really lost almost all of their native vegetation and vegetation in general, and almost all of their native fish. So those are tilapia. Uh, they're definitely important. And I believe you also have to dispatch them when you catch them. But they were brought in as sport fish. So that's something we all have to think about as well. Another uh, kind of introduction gone wrong. And so thinking about plants a little bit, uh, elephant ear is something that is really obvious whenever I'm in a river. You, we know there's a ton of other native plants that'll create, non-native plants that will create a bed in the river, but these elephant ears will line the banks and they're huge. These huge dense stands of these really pretty plants, but they're definitely it's pretty obvious that that's not the way it's supposed to be right there. So the elephant ear was actually introduced to the states in 1910 as a substitute crop for potatoes and then was later cultivated as an ornamental plant. And it ended up spreading from the South US to Central Texas. They do really well over there. So there's a bunch of varieties that are sold in the nursery trade despite how invasive it is. And that's due to the economic importance of that species. It sells a lot. Uh, I had one at my house growing up. They're pretty. They are very common, even as a house plant inside, but definitely more so as an outside landscape plant. So they took hold in the South Channel downtown, uh, probably in the 2010, 
kind of area uh, time frame. And they eventually made their way down to the Mission Reach, uh, the restored area downstream. So you can see them there. And you can definitely see them in the King William area, probably in uh, Museum 2. So widely available houseplant, prefer the water's edge. They love the slightly acidic soil, lots of organic matter. So the sides of streams are really good for them. They are really good at invading streams and other natural riparian areas and wetlands. And they're incredibly difficult to control. So these plants can grow up to nine feet tall. They have underground stems and they're somewhat bulb-like. So they reproduce primarily vegetatively. Uh, uh, so the stem with the bulb can really detach and reproduce that way. Uh, disturbance really encourages their growth and is great at facilitating the spread of them. And so they have a few different ways by which they can propagate pretty easily. I'm not too well versed on them, but I'd say there's three or four. Four. And so they're often planted alongside water bodies, and that's the primary pathway that can result in that spread. And these are two of the different um, parts of which it can spread. You've probably seen these corms, calms uh, in the store, a nursery store, you can buy them in a little bag and you plant them and it'll grow. And they also have these little tubers or um, bulbs on the bottom as well that you can just break off and throw them in the soil and they will grow. So very easy to propagate them. They have these rhizomes which extend from the bulbs so when we're removing these, we have to be really delicate and precise. So this is also known as taro. I don't really think I said that, but it invades these wetlands, colonizes rivers, streams, lake banks. And as you saw in that one photo, it really forms these really dense growth strand, uh, stands and so the leaves, as you saw, are really huge, and they provide a lot of shade, too much shade, so much that they can easily outcompete the native species by filtering out light for these uh, native understory plants. And this alters the natural habitat, ecosystem processes, uh, reduces biodiversity, kind of like how those zebra mussels did. They completely occupied the habitat on the bottom. This basically does it from above in a way. You need light to grow and you need space and these don't allow for that. So it can reduce, eliminate all the native plant species. I see this a lot at uh, Woodlawn by the Brackenridge, Brackenridge Park, I believe. There's tons of these elephant ears over there. And so coupled with these uh, invasive nutria, which are a mammal that were introduced and they're, you probably don't see them much, but they're pretty abundant here. I've only seen one and it was trapped. So when you couple them, the, the elephant ear with the invasive nutria, uh, establishment of native plants and restoration is really difficult. The elephant ear is toxic to mammals and to the nutria. So these nutria will only eat native vegetation, uh, which just leaves the elephant ear to take over. And so we're starting to see a bit of this in the mission reach. And that's something we're thinking about is uh, trying to address this before it really becomes a huge problem. And these elephant ears, uh, also modify the stream channel physically um, by allowing sediment to accumulate on the banks and uh, narrowing the channel. So habitat size is kind of, is decreased for certain species, for fish, for bugs. So it's pretty obvious there. 
the elephant ear is rhizominous, which means it puts out enough roots to stabilize the banks and hold itself very steady. So with that, it stabilizes the banks, which we would think is a really good thing, right? But this dense and really tall vegetation prevents ideal angling conditions uh, when we need to remove these for other uh, other reasons uh, to help replenish native vegetation for increasing angling opportunities, other trying to modify the stream channel to uh, remove all that sediment. If we need to remove them, they can destabilize the banks that they've colonized. So it's really kind of this weird give and take that we all have to think about. And this personal preference of aesthetics as well. A lot of people really like it. It's used as an ornamental plant, right? But personally, when I see it in a river, it makes me sad because <laughs> it's the only plant you can see. But it's gorgeous outside on the lawn. And so the economic impacts from uh, elephant ear really stem from the management actions. So these small stands of elephant ears along the riverbanks could be safely controlled with certain herbicides, but as with a lot of plants, it probably takes a few repeated applications to kill the elephant ear plants because of their large uh, root systems underneath. Also, because the roots of the elephant ear really hold the soil in place and end up preventing erosion of the soil into the river, removing these stands of elephant ear from the bank could, uh, or usually does, uh, necessitate the need for a reestablishment of native plants. So after this elephant ear stand has died, native plants should be planted, or we're going to have uh, a lot of erosion really fast. And there will be some erosion even after that, but trying to mitigate the effect of that is uh, probably one of the best management actions we can uh, take. So management of any species is associated really with the cost, both financial and uh, the cost of labor, people hours. And so the River Authority actually sometimes treats these with herbicides and a mild manual removal, but uh, personally, I haven't really heard of this lately. I think we put it on hold for a little while, but there definitely has been taught, uh, talk of expanding the program and more intensively targeting them in the near future. And so if we think a little bit, uh, Steve? yes. I'm sorry, we've uh, we've really only got about five minutes left. Totally fine. Okay. I just want to make sure we can get to some questions I've got in the chat because uh, especially people are people have questions about the apple snail removal. So okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt and rush and rush you through. This no is, worries. This has been really great and really comprehensive. I'm glad. But go ahead. Uh. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take any questions. Uh, that would be great. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, sorry, sorry yeah. to, uh, to, to have to rush this along. But um, since we decided to uh, let this program tonight count as training for the apple snail removal program, um, which, which I know we didn't advertise that way. It was a decision uh, we made before we opened up the meeting, everyone. Um, I do want to go ahead and get to those questions um, from everybody. So uh, specific to the apple snails, um, people are wondering uh, if, there, if they have any predators in the San Antonio River. No, so they don't have any predators. And that's something that a lot of invasive species um, or non-native species uh, really have no predators. So there's nothing that I know of elsewhere that really uh, can control them. Right. So we have nothing here that can do so. Right, okay. Um, 
we have a participant wondering, uh, besides removing the eggs at the river edge, uh, can people participate uh, uh, through doing scuba to remove these egg cases? So really the only areas that we're focusing on is the river walk right. and the egg casings are always above the water. Above so the water, right. they'll never be um, in the water. The snails, when it's cold, will go right to the bottom. Uh, okay. Yeah, to but kind of the, protect themselves. The eggs are always above the water. Always. Um, and I don't know, can anybody scuba dive in the San Antonio River in the city? Not that I know of, no. Not that I know of, yeah. No. It would, that would be fun, but um, I know you can scuba in nearby rivers like San Marcos, um, mm -hmm. but but I don't think you can here. Um, and so you were talking about um, tilapia, the blue tilapia earlier, and um, and mentioning that, of course, that, that was at one point introduced as a stock fish. Um, and I, we've all seen people fishing at the river before. So if people are fishing and catching tilapia, I mean, they can eat it, right? Um, I think our best bet is to advise against eating the fish from the river. Um, okay. Yeah. If you're in another river, potentially, I think you would have to check uh, the wildlife department's uh, standards for uh, the metrics that they would quantify it to be safe. I'm not okay. actually too familiar with what we have on our river, but I would say no. Right. Okay. So we, we see people fishing on the river, but there are no fishing licenses given out to do that. It sounds like is what is, as far as you know, you do need a fishing license from what I know. You don't need a fishing license to fish in any state park though. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay. Back to the apple snails. Um, sorry, one second. I'm reading through this. Um, somebody's asking about uh, safety uh, while collecting them and um, um, basically just uh, just just mentioning that um, using rubber gloves or uh, nitrile gloves or something something that's that's non-permeable while collecting the eggs. Sorry, that wasn't really a question. <laughs> no, yeah, you're spot on there. Definitely any kind of uh, rubber glove you can get your hands on and yeah. definitely use a kind of any kind of scooper uh, to get those egg casings off. Right, right, okay. Um, let's see. Um, well, that might be all the questions that we've had so far, sorry, bear with me. I'm, I'm reading through it. Um, again, I did just want to remind everyone that our presentation tonight is actually going to qualify you to participate in the apple snail removal program. Um, so that's, that's a big, a big bonus, uh, for us tonight. We have recorded tonight's program and we're going to put it on our YouTube page. And you can find our uh, our YouTube page if you just go to YouTube and search Alamo Area Master Naturalist. So if you feel like you missed anything at the beginning um, and want to watch this program again or share this with anybody, um, we're gonna have it. We're gonna have it there for you to see again. And um, uh, Minna and Steve, I'm gonna read out your emails because uh, although they are in the chat, just to make sure that everybody can hear them. Um, Steve, your email is S B I T E N E R. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. And that's at, um, is that at riverauthority.org? It's at sariverauthority.org. Sariverauthority.org. Perfect. 
And Minna's is M P A U L P A U L. I'm sorry, M P A U L at S A River Authority dot org. And so you guys that are interested in actually participating in the apple snail removal program um, can email Minna and um, and she's going to gauge interest that way and um, and move everybody on to the next steps. So sorry, Steve, to, to rush you through to the end, but You're thank good. you so much. This was this was such an amazing, comprehensive program tonight. And uh, I really, really appreciate it. You did a great job. Thank you. Very grateful for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it. And um, I suppose that's all, Minna. If you if you have anything else, um, that would be all. Um, you can send it to either mpaul at sariverauthority.org or to volunteer at sariverauthority.org. Both of, both of those emails come to me, and I can respond. Send you the waivers. Uh, send you the link to um, you know uh, record the uh, dispatch of apple snails. Um, only quickly, I'd like to let you know that uh, coming up this month, love is in the air, and we have a um, push to um, to make a big dent in the litter we see on our watershed. So if you haven't heard about it, I have a training coming up on February 15th. Uh, it's a virtual quick half an hour training about Literati, the app that you can record a litter that you see in our watershed. Uh, it's a pretty amazing tool um, for a long-term um, dream of, you know, tra uh, trash-free San Antonio. Um, another a big um, component of, you know, um, water quality uh, in our river. So if you'd like that, uh, please email me and I can send you that information. Or if you go to the Basura Bash website, uh, Basura Bash is the event coming up on February 19th. Uh, it's an, you know, citywide event where thousands of volunteers will be picking up trash on all uh, most creeks um, uh, here in San Antonio. So please join, uh, go to that website. We have a site. Unfortunately, we are full with our site, but there are a lot of other sites with just openings still open. But please, if you can come to that training that I'm, you know, we'll be doing on the 15th of February um, at 6.30. Um, that will give you a little bit more about this very cool, simple app to use to, to document litter. And this is the only way we can actually, you know, uh, take care of the training trash problem in our watershed on a long term. So please join us with that. Um, and then just quickly, uh, I am start going to be introducing a, a docent program, which we I know the Master Naturalist have wanted for, for some time now. Uh, that'll be coming up in fall. I'm prepping for it. So if you have interest in joining that, please email me. And we are also putting together a paddling crew. This is going to be an elite group of volunteers that support our teams as well. So these are some of the quick things coming up. There are a lot of different things we do. And our liaisons are Peter, Cheryl, and Christopher Fullerton. Please contact them if you'd like to know more about some of the other programs we do. So that's a quick recap. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Stephen. You were amazing. Um, and I know that our Apple Snail team, uh, as well as our Beaver Dam teams, are some of our top volunteer teams that do a lot of great work with us. So I hope you'll join us. Um, thank you so much, um, Amanda, for this opportunity. And uh, please, please reach out to me with questions, anything that you'd want uh, to know. Uh, we are here to support you. And Master Naturalists are our top tier volunteer. We love you. So thank you. For all you do. Oh, thank you guys. Um, we're, we've got lots of thank yous coming through the chat as well. This was a, a great program tonight and, and turns out a great training opportunity as well to get, to get people involved. So thank you, Minna, for all that info. Um, we love to get that info out for, for our members and, and get people, get people out there. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the meeting.